fix them in case I need to. Good morning. Thanks for blessing us with that. I've given uh, to Brother Don and Brother Ron copies of our study guide. If anybody doesn't have one, they will just raise your hand. I'm hoping everyone has one. We're going to have a short message today that I know will be a blessing because it's a focus on our Savior, Jesus Christ, on this high Sabbath. And as we begin, as I try to remember, to make sure we focus on this text, on the scripture, rather than on this text on our phones. I just um, want to mention that because I sometimes forget to turn mine off. And today, by the way, as many of you know, is a special day because it's a communion Sabbath. Praise God for that. My first opportunity to be here to fellowship with you in this special event. But also for some of you who've been kind enough to contact my wife, it happens to be my wife Linda's birthday. So I'm thankful for that. The only problem is uh, last year I missed her birthday. I was in London, England. This year I'm missing her birthday. I'm here in Kansas. I mean, she's in Kansas. I'm here in California. And uh, this is the second time in a row I've missed my wife's birthday. But, you know, thank God she's gracious. I'm thankful for her. But uh, so as this is also live streaming, we want to welcome the folks who are here and uh, those who are here in person. God bless you. We're so thankful for, to have you fellowshipping with us, to worship with us today, April 6th. And we're also glad for those who are joining us online and perhaps those who will join us later. Today is actually the seventh Sabbath. For those who have been keeping track, since I have had the privilege to share messages of hope, of challenge, of joy, of learning with all of us, we've called it our journey of faith. If you've been following with us, number one, and uh, today, as you can see, is a special focus on friendship, foot washing, and faith. Now, thankfully, many of you who've been here for many Sabbaths, you know we have encouraged all of you to participate in filling out a study guide so that you can keep track of the message. You can go home like those faithful Bereans found in Acts chapter 17 to see whether these things are so. And then you can also share this with others afterwards if the Lord impresses you. But also we've been encouraging our kids especially. And when I say kids, anyone uh, up to 19 years of age. All right? <laughs> if you will fill them out, uh, today is the seventh one. I encourage you, if you can get half a dozen done, somebody already this morning handed in me to me their six completed um, study guides because next Sabbath, on our 50th anniversary, celebration of the very day that church services began in this building, and by the way, for those who wonder, I did go to the Record Gazette and I searched there through their microfiche to see in case something had been said 50 years ago. I could not find anything in our local newspaper. But our local history here tells us next Sabbath will be the 50th anniversary of God's blessings in this church. So we want you to come back as we've already announced. We want to invite those who may have just joined us seeing this online. Please come fellowship with us. We will be blessed that Sabbath. You can start with us on Friday evening, 7 o'clock. I'll be going all the way until Sabbath afternoon after a special fellowship meal. And after the fellowship meal, we will then be, in the afternoon, giving to those who have completed at least six of these uh, study guides. We're talking about anybody up to 19 years of age. We have a special gift for you. So come next Sabbath and be blessed as we fellowship together, remembering God's grace and God's goodness here. Now, as I remember the story, my best recollection... It was a lady who was on her way home, driving at night. Anybody done that here, ladies? Let me see the hands. I see heads nodding. You know, and when you're driving home alone late at night, and uh, you're on the highway, and no one else is around, you kind of get that little uneasy feeling. You know what I'm talking about? It's late at night, and then you look in your rear view mirror, and there's a truck behind you. True story. And she, so she saw this truck behind her. It wasn't long before that truck came ever closer and right, right behind her. And of course, she tried to uh, accelerate. The truck was there. She slowed down. The truck was there. Nothing seemed to shake this truck driver. And her heart was beating faster, faster. And she was trying to get home. And uh, not only did the truck come close, it came so close that the lights were bearing down on you. You know what? You know what I'm talking about, some of you? 
When those huge trucks and they come along, and, and thank God for truckers because I know it's not an easy job. They drive awkward hours and they, they're delivering goods to us. But when you have a truck driver behind you with lights beating down on you and your heart is thumping and he won't leave you and you, no matter if you go slow or fast, he stays there. You can just sense something is wrong. And eventually she took this, uh, t- turned off the highway and uh, as she turned off the highway, the truck followed her. Oh no! And she's now hurry, hurrying to her, her home and she eventually got there and pulled into the driveway and the truck was right behind her. And the truck driver jumped, stopped and jumped out and opened the back door and there was a man hiding behind the seat of the driver. The caring truck driver chased a woman to save her life. Thank you. Praise God. Open your study guides because you'll see there humans too often may tend to run away from God. Yet, God is not. Put that three, those three letters there in your study guide. God is not someone to be afraid of. The God of the Bible is a compassionate being who wants to be a friend of each of us. Please put those words in your study guide as we begin. God is not someone to be afraid of. God is someone to be a friend of each of us. As we reflect today on the friendship, the love of Jesus, let's think carefully, deeply, of this lady who is fleeing from her Savior, if you please. Because the truck driver could see what was on the back seat. Somebody who was about to harm this lady. She didn't know it. And so many times that's how we are as human beings. We flee instead of realizing God is wanting to be our friend. John chapter 15, verse 15 and 14. It's in your study guide. Talking to his disciples, Jesus said, notice the language here, I speak to you as my what? Friends, I speak to you as my friends. By the way, anybody here have a, had a friend for at least, at least 50 years? Remember we celebrate next week the 50th anniversary? Let me see the hands of, you'll, you'll, you'll date yourselves. You will saw the seniors. Uh, I see. It uh, uh, doesn't work. Uh, I see, who's that? Andre raising his hand. 50, 5-0. Five, <laughs> okay, not 15. I see a few hands going up. Precious friends, right? We've got friends who are half a century. I have one. I've known him more longer than I've known my wife. And he's dear to me. He's my best buddy. All right? But this is the type of friendship that some of us have been blessed with. I love the way Jesus puts it. You are my friends if you what? Obey. Put those four important letters there. If you obey me. You're my friends. It's this wonderful friendship that God wants to have with us. Instead of fleeing from him like the lady. Now she didn't know. We know. She didn't know. But the truck driver was there to save her life. And yet she was fleeing. You know, sometimes we as humans don't realize this is the God who cares. He wants to take care of us. He wants to be our friend. I'm glad that this afternoon at 3.30 we're going to gather together. And it says Pathfinders. But I want to extend that after Brother Brent Shakespeare has his sanctuary class. We're going to go out as friends to God into nature. God's second book. This is the first book, the Bible. But this afternoon, and thank God for beautiful weather, Matt Forrester will be leading us. We're going to go out into God's second book to spend time with our Savior, the one who loves us. So you can join us this afternoon at 3.30 right here. You'll be blessed. But let me share with you a little biblical background on this question of where does the idea of foot washing come from? And, and you know, I was raised in a Christian Seventh Avenue family and I didn't understand or know these things. You know, it's kind of interesting. As you grow, you're like, where do these things come from? But I want to remind you of something you'll see right now. During the time when Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph lived, people used to walk even long distances by foot on dusty paths. We'll experience that this afternoon. Thus, when they got to the end of traveling, their feet were dirty. Dusty, if you please, all right? And you see that this is what happened. And so think back in the time thousands of years ago. Think back in Bible times what happened. And so I've got a few texts I'm going to share with you again on your study guide. Genesis chapter 43 verse 24 says, talking about the time of Joseph, 
This is when the, his brothers had come back for the second trip to Egypt. Then the steward brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed the dust off their feet. Now back then, people washed their own feet. I didn't realize that until I began to look further study. Genesis chapter 18, verse 4, it's on your study guide. Chapter 19, verse 2, chapter 24, verse 33. That's for you to go back and read later on. I like to give you a little homework assignment every now and then. And it's amazing. I never knew that. If you read it carefully, the, they brought, if you were a guest, when I say a guest, even a stranger. Remember Abraham, Genesis 18, verse 4. The, he welcomed those three guests there, and they prepared the water so they could wash their own feet. So originally... Three, four thousand years ago, it's apparently they provided water so you could take care of your own feet. However, fast forward a little further, you get to 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 41. And you know the story of David and Abigail. And here, speaking to David, Abigail humbly stated, it's on your study guide, I am ready to serve, she said. I'm ready to wash the feet of my master's servants. By now, about a thousand years after Abraham or so, we'll see to wash the feet of someone else was understood as a very humble role or duty of a slave or, next word to write in there, a servant. But originally you washed your own feet. And then later on it became the role of a servant to wash the feet of somebody. So, you know, as customs happen. By the way, if you come from a place that has traditions and customs, you find that out. Especially if you talk to your grandma or great-grandmother. They'll say, well, it wasn't this way when I was young. <laughs> okay, it, The custom has changed slightly. I see people smiling. That's what happens. Customs morph. They change. So no longer was it that you wash your own feet. Now it's the role of a servant. Now you know what's interesting? When we get to the Bible, and I'm going to encourage you to read later on, John chapter 13. Because it's a beauty, beautiful chapter where Jesus got these followers, his 12 disciples, the apostles together. He knew he was going to be crucified. So he got them together to celebrate what they used to call back then the Passover. And Jesus made some adjustments in that uh, ceremony. And that's where he instituted what we now call the Lord's Supper, a communion time together. But before the eating of the emblems and the drinking of the unfermented wine, it's interesting, there was this, and it's recorded only in the book of John, John chapter 13. And as you know the story so well, John, the beloved, was a very close disciple of Jesus. The best we know, he was probably a younger person, more open to listening and growing. And John records this amazing story in John chapter 13, which I encourage you to read. And of course, you, as you read it, you'll find out something interesting. Jesus turned this custom around. Leaders are now called to serve. Instead of a servant washing the feet, Jesus turns the whole thing around. And this ordinance of foot washing has deep meaning for all. Today, I'm just going to summarize it. Again, I've encouraged you already to take time this afternoon, this week, to read deeper, reflect on this beautiful uh, experience of what Jesus did. But there are four lessons I want to share with you to take home with you. What does it mean? What is it? Why do we as Seventh-day Adventists and some other churches participate in what we call foot washing? Now you'll notice the title for my message today is Friendship, Foot Washing, and Faith. And I thought I would take just a few moments to remind some of us and perhaps help us if we didn't, we're not aware of it, what this represents. Number one, the foot washing represents a cleansing of the heart. If you please, a kind of a mini baptism. Put the word heart in as I read to you now from the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 6. Jesus was washing the feet. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Uh, don't you love Peter? At least I, I resonate with Peter, to be honest. I am sometimes, sometimes like Peter. Bombastic, jump in there and just, you know, it's, stay, say what I want to say. But uh, this happens for some of us at times. And this is Peter. You're never going to wash my feet. Okay? 
Oh, Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And now Peter realized, wait a minute. And so what does Peter do? Typically Peter. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not just my feet, my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> oh, Peter's always all in. He's either all out, <laughs> don't touch me, and then do everything. I want to have a complete bath. <laughs> this is Peter. Interesting. Oh, that story of Peter is so interesting. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed, we understand as a symbol of baptism, he who has been baptized, need only to wash his feet, and then he is completely clean. And so here we understand it to be a mini-baptism. You've been baptized, you accepted Jesus as your Savior, and uh, then during the course of life, as we are human beings with these natures of us, fallen natures, we slip, we fall, we sin, and so these are a kind of a mini-baptism, a cleansing of the heart. And we're so thankful for God's grace. He does not give up on us. The second lesson, it shows we have made things right with others. Back in that beautiful Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, we find Jesus saying, forgive others as they forgive you. Now you forgive them. There's this a give and take. We must make things right with others. Uh, where the prayer, the special prayer of Jesus is the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us as we forgive our debtors. We we know that prayer so well. So we, it shows that we have made things right. Put that word in your study guide. We've made things right. Hearts have been reconnected by God's grace. This is part of the meaning of the communion service. Number three, it means we treat each other as equals to love each other. Very important. Sharing and showing the love of God that are, it's in our hearts for each other. By the way, again, I'm encouraging you, make sure you read John chapter 13 completely, that whole chapter at home. And so put the word love in there. Number two is the word right. Number three is the word love. And finally, the fourth lesson, it teaches us that Jesus came to serve as a humble Savior. He was willing to wash the feet. He took the role of a servant. He actually said, I have come to serve. You know, this is the challenge we face sometimes in today's culture. Uh, one of the things you ask uh, kids nowadays, what do you want to be when you grow up? Years ago it used to be, I want to be a fireman, I want to be a teacher, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a nurse, I want to be an engineer. Nowadays, what do you want to be? And you know what kids say? Famous. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be famous. Uh, wait a minute, you get, uh, it used to be kids were involved and interested in doing what? In a role of service or working to earn a living. Now I want to be famous. This is interesting. We're in a world nowadays and it's, I'm not blaming the kids. It's the reality of what they see so much. They see fame and acclamation. This is the reality. And so we as Christians need to encourage our kids to focus on how they can serve as, as Jesus, our humble Savior, our example is. This is unfortunately the, the world in which we live. So parents and teachers and others, please encourage them. The greatest joy comes in serving others. I thought I'd get an amen out of that. Let's try that one more time. Maybe you don't believe that. Well, if you don't, let me remind you. <laughs> okay, The greatest joy in life comes from serving others. Amen. Yes. That's what it is. And so that's what we need to encourage our kids. Let's now focus on what happens. Those disciples, if you read the story in John 13, they're all sitting and watching and, uh, because they were expecting a servant to come along and they did nothing. They had all been quibbling about who can be the most famous. Go read the story. That's what they said. John chapter 13. Back then, they had the problem back then. <laughs> Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? And so they were there with resentment in their hearts and they were looking around, where's the servant who's going to come and wash our feet and nothing happened? And so notice this beautiful statement. It's in your study guide. How could he, that's Jesus, show that it is loving service, true humility, which constitutes real, what's the word? Greatness. How was he to kindle love in their hearts and enable them to comprehend that he lo what he longed to tell them? Jesus waited for a time to see what they would do. And they did nothing. Then he, the divine teacher, began to wash the disciples' feet. So Christ expressed his love for his disciples. He gave them an example that they would never forget. Never. 
It's like going to a, a special lunch with the president of whichever country you may be from. Here in the United States, you go to the lunch with the president. And when you get there, you're asking, where is the president? And you wait, and out comes the president of the United States carrying your tray of food <laughs> or your dessert. What's going to happen to your face? <laughs> you'll, you'll be shocked. People will jump up and say, no, Mr. President, I'll carry it for you, right? <laughs> we don't expect that. But no, the kind of Jesus we serve is the one who gave them an example that they would never forget. Wow. And that's the example for us. Now, years ago when I was uh, serving in another conference, I'll never forget how an elder of a church who I happened to have met out on the east somewhere contacted me and he said to me, Pastor, I need your counsel. I need your advice. Please let me know. What should I do? At our church, there is an Achan in the camp. By the way, if anybody knows the Old Testament story of Achan, who basically was a thief and he stole goods. You remember the story in, uh, what's it, the book of Joshua, right? Read it later on. And he said to me, there's an Achan in the camp. I thought, hmm, looks like you, you want to stone somebody because that's what they did. They stoned Achan, put him to death because he was a thief and he caused so many problems. I said, who is this Achan? And on the phone, I never forgot, he said to me, it's our pastor. I realized this gentleman was, now he didn't want to physically kill the pastor, thank God, but he was looking for a way to get rid of the pastor. And I said, what should I do, pastor? What's your advice? And I was on the other end of the phone thinking, how do I tell this elder? And he was a, he's an educated man. He was a psychologist, worked at the prison. Uh, he's a psychiatrist, by the way, medical doctor, psychiatrist. He, so he knew how to handle people. And now he wants to um, get rid of the pastor because he's the Aiken in the camp. And I never forget, the Lord gave me an idea. And I thought I said to him, uh, when is your communion service coming up? He said, it's coming up soon. I said, uh, how did Jesus respond to the Aiken in the camp at that time? His name was Judas. Hmm. He washed the feet of Judas. So I said to him, how about, why don't you go to your pastor and offer that at the upcoming communion service, you would be willing to wash his feet. By this time, the, old, the, the, the pastor knew that there was some dissonance between him and this elder. And I'll be honest, later on this elder contacted me and said, I went to the pastor and he was shocked that I'd offered to wash his feet. So I want to challenge each one of us. Jesus chose to wash the feet of even Judas. One last passage. John 13, 17. Jesus said, write it in. Happy are you if you do them, these things. This is what Jesus is encouraging us to do, to take time to reflect, to participate in this wonderful ordinance of humility, we sometimes call it, because it, it's humbling to go onto your knees and wash the feet. We do that of strangers. We do that of family members. We want to make sure that hearts are united. And by the way, the word happy, in some Bibles, you know what it says? It says blessed. You can choose either word, kids. Blessed or happy. If you follow the example of Jesus and do what he calls upon us to do, we will be blessed. We will overflow with joy if we follow Jesus' example. Now, at the end of your study guide, you'll notice at the bottom in red, for that second ordinance, I've just reminded you, and we're going to participate with that after our time of foot washing here. We will remind you, and it's on your study guide, so you can take it home with you, that Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it. Take, eat, this is my body. This is, of course, the unleavened bread, showing the sinless body of Jesus, broken for us. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, drink from it. And Matthew 26, do this in remembrance of me. We're going to pause right here, Firstly, to welcome you again and tell you how glad we are you're with us. 
we as Seventh-day Adventists practice what we call, officially, open communion. What that simply means is this. If you are a committed Christian, you've given your life to the Lord, you have made a commitment to live for Him, in, even if you're not a member of the Seventh Adventist Church. According to our church manual, you are welcome to participate with us. So we want to invite you and say, we're glad you're here. Please join us. And we have three places where we will participate in this ordinance of foot washing. One of them is right here in the sanctuary. We've got some rooms here where the couples and families are welcome to go. The second one will be for the men. You will be in the youth room and the women will be in the junior room. Now, as you go out, if you want to join us, if you've never been here before, and by the way, this is my first time to participate in communion, so I also have to look around, but there'll be men standing outside for the men's room, which is the youth room, and there'll be women standing outside to welcome you into the junior room. So if you're a lady, you want to go there, men or couples and their families can remain to participate right here in the sanctuary, in these rooms. And at the end, when we are done, we're going to sing together. Not now, but at the end. But I want you to think about the song that the Lord has impressed me to want us to sing together. At the end, when our service is over, it's called Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Because I want to challenge us as we participate in the foot washing to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. To keep thinking about what He means to us and for us. Because he is the only one that you and I can lean on, can trust through the challenges we face in this world. So may God bless you as you disperse to the different places. And may God continue to guide us through this wonderful service for his glory. Amen.